Hey, welcome to Church Experience. Thank you so much for spending part of your weekend with us. Now's a great time to grab your pens and weeklies and head to your seats if you haven't already, because the service starts in 90 seconds. Hello family, welcome to CE Online. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. We're so excited about today's service. We believe that this could be the best and most impacting hour of your week. Throughout the service, if you have any questions, comments, prayer requests, please go to churchexperience.tv slash connect or just pull out your camera app, hit the QR code to connect with us. If you have any questions, want to know what's going on here at CE, just hit the subscribe button right here. We would love to hear from you and we'll be praying for you. We're ready to dive in. Would you stand to worship with us as we sing songs to Jesus?
Just one word You calm the storm that surrounds me Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our God can do Just one word You hear what's broken inside me Just one word And you revive every dream Just one touch I feel the power of hell Just one touch, my eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can do, there's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can do. Oh, there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison wall he can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. So let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. So let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. So let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. No, there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison wall you can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. No. worship you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your presence, for your wisdom and grace and mercy. God, we just praise you. We worship you. We open our hearts to you to receive a message that we know is just for us from you. And we thank you and we just praise your mighty name, Jesus. Amen.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for tuning in as we are starting a new season of Life Groups at Church Experience. Today, we have some very special guests joining us who have some great insight for us all as we near this upcoming season. So let's jump in. Guys, thanks for being here with us today. Can you please tell us your name and a little bit about your life group? Hi, I'm Erin Emmington, and we're part of the New Experience Life Group. That's right, and I'm Josh Emmington, and it is the number one life group. We absolutely love it. Hey guys, my name is Merrick McKenzie, and I'm in the same life group with Josh and Aaron. Guys, I gotta tell you, I'm excited because uh, we got the opportunity to be in a couple of life groups, right? First one, uh, New Experiences, and also Vertical Marriage. Last year, you were on the team. So please tell us, what were some of the highlights for you from last season? One of my favorite memories from this last season was taking the Calypso dinner cruise out of Clearwater as a life group. And so we had dinner together on the cruise, a good time of fellowship and friendship, and then boating around um, the Tampa Bay area. It was just so beautiful and such a memorable time together. You know, one of the most memorable things I gotta tell you, Aaron made this mango strawberry ice cream cake. Man, I'm thinking about it right now and I can taste it, right? It was awesome. One of the other things I loved is the fact that we had two different types of segments when we met, right? For example, we had Faith Day, right? And we had Hangout Day. And Hangout Day was always fun as well as Faith Day. Both of those really worked together to help us to grow closer to God and in our journey. And I gotta tell you, we are so much of a closer group right now that, man, it just feels like these are gonna be friends for the rest of my life. We did everything from going through a couple different Bible studies, including Daring Faith by Rick Warren, to serving a, a couple families that were in need. And it's just been a lot of fun to be able to spend time with each other in each other's houses and become real friends. That sounds great. It sounds like you guys became a close-knit group. Guys, we have some breaking news right here, right now, live for you. It looks like uh, Trey Robinson has been traded. Am I reading this right? Trey Robinson has been traded from the men's basketball group to the marriage group. That is breaking news. You heard it here first. So now we've heard you talk about some highlights from last season. So what can people expect from this season? I'm excited about our missions that we're looking forward to do in 2024, just diving into our community and just helping um, families in need. Man, next season is gonna be amazing. We already have all these grand designs. The groundwork is laid now that we've developed these amazing relationships. The thing that's also good is not only are we help growing and getting closer to God, but we've done a few things with helping some folks in the community, which is something that we, we, we get excited about. An ability to go out and do some actual missions, get our hands dirty in God's work and be on mission, um, going out and helping people that are in need and having some acts of mercy that we do together as friends, as teammates. Wow, guys, that's awesome stuff. And, and I gotta tell you, you guys got me excited and it makes me wanna go out there and join a team. Yes, <laughs> awesome. You've got so many incredible things going on this season. Yeah, yeah, let's go get it, let's do it. And we encourage everyone to get out there and join. The best thing is you don't even have to try out for the team. You automatically make the team just by signing up. So if you're interested in joining a team, get with a coach. We actually have multiple coaches and teams. You can find the perfect one that's perfect just for you. So let's go ahead and get that code up on the screen for you to start scouting out all the teams or to actually go ahead and choose your team of choice. So if you can just leave that code up on the screen for us, we appreciate that. Eric, thank you so much. Yeah, we absolutely loved it, Eric. The pleasure was all mine. Again, thanks for joining us. You know, as we sign off here, that if anybody has a chance to get involved with their own life group, they absolutely should. Man, I, I can't wait. I'm excited. I love what we're doing. Love this being part of the journey here. Just love it. Let's, let's do it, guys. We want to thank you guys for tuning in today and joining us. And best of luck on your future victories. And we'll be rooting for you. So on behalf of everyone, here at CE, I want to thank you all for tuning in and joining us. Go sign up now.
Welcome to week number two of our Aim Higher teaching series, where every week we're going after new vision, new goals, taking new territory in this new year. And I know this time of year, everybody's dreaming about what could be and what should be in their life. And maybe you have some new rhythms and new schedules at the front end of this year, but whatever it is that you're going after, we're all aiming higher. And that's how it should be. We should always be looking to make progress and move things forward. But we want to do it in a healthy way, in a sustainable way. And one of the key aspects of that is what we're going to talk about today, and that's relationships. I've titled today's message, Never Climb Alone. Because as you're moving towards the summit of that mountain in your life, as you're aiming higher, as you're moving forward with that new vision, it'll make it so much more fun. It'll make it so much better if you include others in the process. Not only will it help you actually get to where you need to go, but in the process of bringing others along, you can raise them higher as well, which gives your life tremendous purpose. It gives you deep fulfillment. So I'm so excited today because we're going to talk about something that perhaps is a familiar topic to you, but I hope that God will open your eyes to see it in a brand new way, to experience it in a fresh way to where you actually include others more in your life and you see more fulfillment, more joy, and more peace as you aim higher. Well, as we begin, I I heard this story. One of my favorite stories is of this guy named Thomas Wheeler, and he was the CEO of the Massachusetts Mutual Life Insurance Company back in the day. And he was driving down a, a highway out in the middle of nowhere with his, his wife, and he needed to stop and get gas. And so he pulled into this, this lone gas station. It was a little run down, a single pump, and there was an attendant there to pump your gas for you. So he, he pulls his vehicle up to the pump, asks the man to fill it up and check his oil, and he goes to stretch his legs. As he's walking around, he looks back at his vehicle, and he sees his wife engaged in an animated conversation with this gas station attendant. And he was just curious, but he goes back, he pays for the fuel, and gets back on the highway, and as they're pulling out, he, he's turning to his wife, and he says, hey, I, I noticed you were you know, really talking to this guy like you knew him. Did, did you know him from somewhere? And, and she says, yeah, actually, it's kind of a funny story. I, I knew him back in high school, and we dated for a whole year. <laughs> and he kind of laughed at this, and he said, well, It's a good thing I came along because if you guys had kept dating, you'd be married to a gas station attendant instead of a CEO. He says this out of a little bit of pride, and she looks back at him with a smile on her face, and she says, no, 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 Thomas. If I'd have married him, he'd be the CEO. You'd be the gas station attendant. (laughs) Now, I love that story because it illustrates the truth, right, that that other people make us better. Right, other people make us better. If it's true in a marriage, they can make us better. It's, it's true in a family. It's true in a church. It's true in a business. But other people will absolutely make you better. The Bible says that iron sharpens iron. Like one man sharpens another. We, we, we sharpen each other. We make each other better. We learn from each other. We encourage each other. There's so much value from including other people in your life. Now, I don't think for a second that you don't have other people in your life, right? I I don't think that you don't work next to people, live next to people, maybe live under the same roof with people, but including other people in the journey in an intimate way, right, in a a close companionship, partnership sort of way, that's what we're talking about today, and and you're going to see some some beautiful things here through God's Word in in Mark chapter 2 where we're going, but but I just want to highlight the fact that when you include others intentionally, you are going to have a lot more fun in the process and you're going to see a lot better results because God meant for you to be in community, not just be a consumer of relationships, but to be a contributor, to invest in others. And and as I heard one person say at one time, they're all the one another's in the Bible, like love one another, pray for one another, care for one another, serve one another, all these sorts of things. You can't do them on your own. Like the only way to fulfill all that God has asked us to do in Scripture is to be in community with others. And so it's an expectation of God, but it's also a privilege and a blessing that he's given us. So here's what we want to do today. We're going to begin in, in Mark chapter 2, and we're going to study this passage of Scripture. And, and, then, and then we're going to get real practical towards the latter half of the message. And we're going to talk about three specific people that you need in your life. Three specific people that you need to make sure in your inner circle to help you 
aim higher. So Mark chapter 2, it's a fascinating story. Let's begin in verse 1. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the man on the mat, uh, the, the mat that he was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat. And walked out in full view of all of them. This amazed everyone. And they praised God. Saying we have never seen anything like this before. (laughs) What an amazing story. Now this story is also told in Luke chapter 5. A parallel version of it. And I I like how the Luke chapter 5 version ends. The the final verse in Luke 5 verse 26. It says everyone was amazed. Gave praise to God. And they were filled with awe. And said We have seen remarkable things today. This this really is a remarkable story. I mean, it's it's incredible. Like all these people packed in this house, the the homes in Capernaum, they tended to be very small and and, and it's filled with people. It's overflowing. You can't even find a spot near the door to look in because there's people standing outside looking in. And and I want you to look at these, these two pieces of artwork from the 1700s. And two different artists who... Kind of drew renderings of what it might have been like in this situation, just to kind of help you imagine the situation. Now, these friends, they come because they have a friend who has a need that they can't solve. And so they want to come to Jesus because they hear that he is a healer. And it's the, absolutely the right decision. And, and they bring him, but they can't get him to Jesus. So, so they get creative and innovative. Whatever it takes mentality, I love that. We're going to find a way. And so they go up on the roof and they, they pull some tiles away and they, they lower this man so that he can get to Jesus and, and be healed. And, and it wasn't about getting him to the place. It was about getting him to the person of Jesus. I love that. They, they were willing to pull back some tiles, do some things differently so that they can get to Jesus. You know, sometimes we think the goal is just, just to get our friends to church, right? That's important, but it's, it's not the end. It's the means to the end. The end is not a place The end is a person. We want to get our friends to Jesus because Jesus can solve their problems. Jesus can change their lives. And whether you share the gospel of Jesus with them over a table at Starbucks or in your living room or you bring them here to hear about Jesus in a compelling way, the important thing is that you get them to Jesus because he's the one that can heal them. He's the one that can change them. He's the one that can restore their family and set them on a new trajectory. So we, we want to take people to Jesus. And, and, and these friends, they had that ambition to get their friend to Jesus. And what great friends, right, that they would go through all of this to help, help their buddy. And don't you wish you had friends like that in your life? Maybe, maybe you do. Maybe some of you do. But, but what a beautiful thing to have, have friends around you that would care so much about you. That, that when you can't help yourself, that they would do whatever it takes to get you the help that you need because they care about you so much. And I think it's a beautiful part of the story. And then there's this part here where you, you got the, the opposite of the close friends. You have these Pharisees who are criticizing what's happening here. They're criticizing Jesus, looking over his shoulder. Who are you to forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. What's interesting, Jesus actually did three things here to show that he was God, Right? Not only did he heal the man, but he saw the private thoughts of the Pharisees. How, how, how creeped out would you be? You're thinking of something, and Jesus says, I, I know what you're thinking. Right? Well, well he, he did. He read right into their minds, and he spoke to what they were actually thinking about. And then he also forgave sins. 
We know that he was God for many reasons, but he forgave sins, he healed the man, and he knew their private thoughts, things that only God can do. And this, this story about Jesus and showing his power is a beautiful thing, but it's not just about the physical healing. See, th- this guy came expecting a physical healing, hoping for a physical healing. That's, that's what his friends wanted. And that's what you and I want, too. We, we want the external blessings of God. We, we want him to care for our needs. And, and many of you, the majority of your prayers are, God, provide for this financial need. God, help me get that new job. God, fix this situation or help this relationship. And we should pray about all these things. God certainly cares about it because he cares about you. God wants to take care of our external needs. But in the same way that this paralyzed man, he, he, he forgave him first before he healed him, Jesus, I think in many ways, was saying, I care more about your soul. I care more about what's on the inside. I care more about the healing that's going to come from the inside to the out than the outside exterior things. And, and physically, we're all going to die. We're all going to break down. So it's great if God heals you of your pain and your problems. And certainly he can, and certainly we should pray for those things. But how much more important is it for the healing in our soul? And some of you, maybe the thing that brought you to God or maybe brought you to a service today is, is you're seeking something on the external parts of your life. And I just want to challenge you to dig deeper. Right? This whole series, aim higher, but dig deeper. Dig a little deeper because when you're aiming higher, it's not just about having a better career, making more money, getting ahead in life. That, that's too shallow of a dream to live for. God's got a bigger vision for your life. God wants you to dig deeper on a soul level. He wants to transform and change you from the inside out, beginning with the inside. Because when God can cleanse out the inside of your life and your mind and your heart, he can transform and change your nature and who you are, no longer living by the the selfish, sinful flesh, but instead begin to learn what it means to to walk by the Spirit of God that's in you as, as a Jesus follower. You will start to experience radical transformation. And everything, and how you see it, how you live, and what you do. And when you experience that kind of transformation, it's going to impact everything on the outside of your life. And so I love that Jesus healed him first on the inside. I want to show you a a clip from what many of you have watched, uh, The Chosen. And it's a clip of, just a brief clip of of this specific scene. And and I want you to see it because it's it's a beautiful rendition of of likely what happened here in this situation. And in, in a modern way, but, but, but I, I love it so much because I want you just to imagine what it would be like to be that guy laying there begging for help and then seeing Jesus heal you and experiencing that. And I want you to imagine yourself being that person that's laid out on the stretcher. And I just want you to imagine what it would be like to have Jesus heal you in that way because that's his desire for you and whatever it is that you're bringing before him today. So just watch this in awe of what Jesus can do. Check it out. Your faith is beautiful. Son, take heart. Your sins are forgiven. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right. But I ask you, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven. Or rise up and walk. It's easy to say anything, no? But to show you so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, my son, rise. Pick up your bed and go home.
What an amazing story. I, I love that clip. It's so beautiful. And, and to, to imagine being there, laid out on the ground and looking up into the eyes of Jesus as he forgives you and then he heals you. I can't imagine those first steps. I can't imagine the joy. And some of you, Jesus is wanting to do the exact same thing in your life right now to help you experience freedom. Freedom from sin, experience joy and life to the full. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I've come to give them life to the full. Jesus wants you to experience life in all of its fullness. He said in John 14, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. He says, he says I'm the life. And if you want to experience real life, real joy, real forgiveness, real hope, it's only found in me. And Jesus has promised that to you if you will seek him and give your life to him. He has so much more for you than you can ever imagine. But you have to trust him. You have to surrender to him. You have to say, yes, Jesus. No more of doing life on my own terms. I'm surrendering to you. And you just surrender your life to Jesus and watch what he'll do. It will blow your mind of what could happen in your life as you give your life to Jesus. Well, Jesus, he, he heals this man and and things start to change, right? He starts to walk. Things are different. It's incredible. And when Jesus heals you, when Jesus changes you, things become new. The old is gone. The new has come. This, this is the gospel, that, that Jesus came to die for our sins so that we could be not only forgiven but restored to God and made right with him and have a relationship with him that changes literally everything. And this is good news because that means he can also change our relationships, and we've all made mistakes in relationships, right? We, we all know the pain of broken relationships, mishandled conflict, words that were said, things that were done that we regret, things that others did to us that still hurt. Right? We all know what relational brokenness is like. But if you're taking notes today, I want you to jot this down. Jesus can heal our relational brokenness. It's not that just that Jesus can heal physical problems. Jesus can heal relational problems. And I love that. I love that. It's a beautiful thing. Jesus can heal us. And so we want to go to Jesus. Just like these friends took their guy to Jesus because they knew he had the answer. That's what we want to do. Every time we have a problem we can't solve, every time we need something, every time we just want to get closer to the Lord, spend some time with him, we know where to go. We know where to go to Jesus. He has our healing. Um, I love the whatever it takes mentality of these guys, right? I mean, they're, they're like, man, we care so much about our friend. We're going to find a way to dig through those tiles. We're going to go on the roof. We're going to drop them in. It doesn't matter what we have to do. We're going to get our friend to Jesus. And how do you develop friendships like that, right? Because these guys are clearly committed. They love this guy. We don't know all the context of the relationship. We don't know their history. But they clearly cared about him. How do you get friendships that are that tight with you, that, that they'll do literally whatever. It's like, it didn't matter, right? Because you know there had to be some tension in that moment. Those, those Pharisees were a little feisty. They didn't know what people were going to think, what's the homeowner going to think, tearing off tiles. It didn't matter to these guys. It's like, we care so much about our friend. Our reputation doesn't matter as much. The work, the risk, all that. Like, we just want to help our friend. How do you develop friendships like that? How, how do you develop relationships like that? Well, it starts with you being that kind of friend to others. That, that's where it begins. When you're that kind of friend to others, other people reciprocate over time. Right? When you take time to listen to others, they'll take time to listen to you. When you care about others, they're going to care about you. When you live a life of loving God and loving people, you will look around one day and you'll see, wow, God has surrounded me with people that also love me. The Bible tells us, though, it doesn't start with them loving you. It starts with you loving them. Right? It says, honor one another above yourself. So we want to put others first. We love first, right? And, and sometimes people don't reciprocate. You might be in a marriage and say, well, I'm, I'm trying. I'm loving, 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 and they're not loving me back, so I'm, I'm about to be done. No, no. Jesus loved us when we were unlovable, and when we rejected him, we were spitting in his face, running the opposite direction, and he never gave up on us, and he loved us, and he forgave us. And so it's a beautiful thing. When, when, when you turn to Jesus, he'll love you no matter what you've been through. But he also expects us to model that same kind of grace towards the people in our lives. And here's the amazing thing. Jesus has power to heal us, but people are his gift to help us. So yes, Jesus is the one to heal us. He's the one that, that can do the miraculous that no one else can do. But his gift to us is other people to help us on our journey, to help us move forward. And so we're going to have different people in our lives in different capacities, 
They're going to fulfill different roles in our life. But, but how do you get these people and who are they? Today, I just want to focus in on three specific people that you need in your life as you aim higher. So let's just briefly look at three different types of people that you need in your life. And I'm going to challenge you to make sure that you have a name with every one of these people in these different categories, and maybe multiple names. But, but you need to have somebody in every one of these categories in your life if you really want to aim higher in a way that will actually be fulfilling when you, when you get to your destination. The first one, the first type of person we need, it comes from Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, God's word beginning in verse 14. It says this, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The Bible says it's beautiful when people bring the good news. When they talk about Jesus, when they share the gospel, it's such a beautiful thing because the gospel is what changes people's lives. It's, it's the story of Jesus, the good news. And, and it tells us that it's the feet of the people who bring it are beautiful. It's our calling. We're called to be bringers of the good news of Jesus. And, and, and I love how Jesus has equipped us with everything we need to share the good news. He's given you your story. He's given you the truth with all the answers in his word. And through his spirit inside of you, he's enabled you with power to do it. Yeah, so many believers never share the good news because they're really hesitant. They're really hesitant and they're, they're fearful. Well, what if certain questions are asked and I don't have the right answers? They're afraid to say, hey, let me get back to you on that. You know, we're fearful about rejection. You know, and Jesus said, you know, don't, don't be ashamed of me, right? You know, like, I'll be ashamed of you in front of my father, right? We're supposed to be bold and courageous. Um, many of us fail to share our, our faith, the most important thing in our life, which could be, the most fulfilling aspect of our life, seeing other people come into the kingdom because we share it. And how beautiful of a thing it is when people do this. And there's such ministry in the marketplace. You know, we think of ministry in terms of inside the walls of the church, and it's a great thing. But, but you have such a platform in, in your workplace and in your school classroom because you know people that we don't know. And you have an opportunity to minister to them before and after work, around the lunch table, building private relationships with friends that you socialize with so that you can not only love on them and enjoy that relationship, but ultimately share the good news with them so their life and eternity can forever be changed. And we want to take those risks relationally, just like these four guys took a risk digging through the hole of someone's home so they can get to Jesus. It's worth it because the end goal of healing is worth the risks along the way. And so the first person we want to have in our life, I'm going to form this in, in the form of a question is, is who am I bringing along as I climb higher with Jesus? Who am I bringing along? You always need someone in your life that you're hoping to share the good news with or mentor or disciple and raise up. Somebody that you're bringing along, raising up, pouring into, right? Because as you pour into others, it's going to do a couple things. It's going to grow you spiritually. You're going to have to go get those answers and you're going to have to learn. You're going to gain confidence. You're going to get experience teaching others. It's going to empower you and strengthen you. But also, it's going to give you tremendous purpose as you see your life making a direct impact on somebody else's life. That might be in the context of you contributing to a life group and investing in people that circle up in your home on a regular basis. That might be mentoring a young man or a young woman that you can pour into or a child. But finding someone that you can bring along as you aim higher. So many people aim higher and it's all about their goals and their vision and what they're going to do. But how much better is life when you make it your ambition to raise the value of others, to help them aim higher, to help them see Jesus and follow him. It's such a fulfilling life. It's what we're called to in scripture. It gives us purpose. Just as an example of that, I got a text uh, the other day from, you guys know we're investing in raising up a lot of lead pastors throughout church experience to, to build churches in other cities. And uh, I, got, I got a text from one of our lead pastors, and he said, you know, he said, um, after we got off the phone today, there was a guy on my front porch. I didn't recognize him, but I met him in the summer. He said, my family is broken. I know we need Jesus, and this is the only safe place that I know to go. He, he said, uh, or, this guy wrote, he says, he just left my house. He's bringing his family of five on Sunday. 
and this is unrelated to the, the other person I was talking about this morning. I love that people are literally showing up at my house, knowing this is a safe place, looking for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for letting me get to do this, and thank you and your family for helping me. And he said, this guy is one of those families that looks like they have everything on the outside, but he's empty on the inside. And man, I, I, I loved getting that text. Because here's a guy, a part of your church, a guy that you've raised up and supported and trained and sent out, is planning a church. And he said, man, I, I just love that in this community where we live, I get to raise up people that are broken and empty on the inside. They would look great on the outside, but on the inside, they're empty. And that's so fulfilling. And he sent me that message probably with joy in his heart. Even though he'd spent hours counseling and coaching and talking to this guy, he's like, man, I have such joy because this guy who's broken, he knew where to go to find Jesus in our home because we've been trained to plant a church. We've been trained to lead in this community and make a difference. We can be light. And that can be your story. God has empowered you, called you, equipped you with everything you need to go and be light in the world. And it's such a fulfilling thing. And so many believers are missing out on what could be one of the greatest joys of their life, bringing others along on the climb as they aim higher. So that's the first person. We want purpose. We want to raise up others. So let me ask you, who are you investing in? Who are you investing in? Who are you inviting to come hear the gospel? Again, it's in your home or in, in the church setting. Who are you bringing to Jesus? That's important. The second person you need in your life is equally valuable in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's look at verse 24. God's word says, And let us, not, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. It's a really good passage. Let us spur each other on. Let us encourage each other. And let us not give up meeting together. You know, I think in our culture, it's, it's real easy to get out of the habit of the things that are actually good for us and get into bad habits for things that are not good for us. That's our, that's our propensity. That's our, our human nature. But one of the things that we can get out of the habit of, which is really destructive to our souls, is getting out of the habit of meeting with other believers and gathering together. And that's, that's why we worship every week collectively. God's commanded us to, to gather together, to worship his name collectively. Yes, you can worship privately, for sure. But there's nothing like worshiping together with God's church. The church has been doing it throughout history. We'll be doing it until Jesus comes back in some form. And we'll be doing it throughout all of eternity. It's, it's part of God's plan. There's something special in the room where the presence of God is there. In God's house with God's people. You just It's not the same experience. And praise God for the internet. When you're really sick or you're out of town, you can follow along. But there's nothing like gathering together with God's people. And so it's a special thing. But it's not just the corporate gathering. It's, it's smaller gatherings and life groups and homes and one-on-one -on -one and mentoring meetings. We all need people in our life to help make us better, to help us grow. Do not forsake the gathering of the believers. It's, it's something that God has, has commanded us to. And we're supposed to spur each other on. We're supposed to encourage each other. And, and, and one of the beautiful aspects of this is, is when you get into these kinds of relationships where you are spurring each other on, and you have people around you, that inner circle that's encouraging you, like these four guys that, that brought their friend to Jesus, you find out, you know what, hey, I'm not the only one. I'm not alone. Others are in this with me. Just for example, uh, there's a good friend of mine here in the church. His name is Levinsky. And uh, we were talking one day, just, just hanging out, chatting. And we, we were talking about Waffle House. Okay, I know it's random. We were talking about Waffle House. And, and just out of curiosity, how many of you here just love Waffle House? Any, any lovers of Waffle House? <laughs> how, many, how many of you are like haters of Waffle House? You're like, I'm not going no matter what. <laughs> so, so Levinsky and I were talking to like, we both would go. It's like no thing for us. Like, in fact, I, I would eat breakfast food like anywhere. But he was saying, my wife will not eat at Waffle House no matter what. Because one time we were there and we saw a cockroach. And he goes, I smiled at her and told her, well, babe, that's what makes the, the hash browns crispy. <laughs> but, he, but he said, she won't eat there because of the cockroach experience. And I said, bro, my wife is the same way for different reasons. She's just like the cleanliness factor is not there for her with Waffle House. She's like, man, I, just, I don't trust that that place is clean and good. So that's their perspective. But Levinsky and I were talking like, we would eat there. It's like, no problem, man. And so it was kind of funny to, to come up into a conversation where I've been thinking about this for a long time. He's been thinking about it for this a long time. And we're both like, oh, man, you too? Oh, man, 
me as well. Oh, your wife, my wife too. It, it, was just, it was just such a funny conversation. But there's been so many moments I've had, whether it's in a life group or talking with other believers, and it's like, oh, thank you for sharing that. Now I know I'm not alone. So you have that same doubt or struggle? Man, so, so good to know. We can encourage each other. We can pray for each other. You've been through that same hard experience. I can relate to that. And we need people in our life that can share common experiences where we get deep enough below the surface. It's fine to talk about sports and weather and career, but, but we need to get on the soul level conversation where we can talk about the real battles inside, the real questions, where we're growing. We should all be growing spiritually to the point when we're in conversations, we should have something to share, something to edify or build up others because there's things going on inside of us that are worth sharing that's going to help lift them up, right? It says encourage each other, spur each other on. And so... We need people in our life that, that we're developing. And how do you get that, that inner circle that's so tight that will tear through a roof to get you to Jesus like this man? Well, you invest in those relationships. You develop them over time. You listen to them. You encourage them. You build them up. And, and it's one of the reasons we're so passionate about life groups. Right? This, this weekend, actually, you see in our lobby, we have a record number of life groups, a record number of opportunities for you to be able to connect with other people, to grow in your faith, to experience life together. And we're making it easy for you. They're all laid out. You can walk by. You can meet the leaders. They've been trained. They're ready to go. They're ready to connect with you. You can sign up online on our website. I mean, there's just abundant opportunities for you to grow spiritually. And we, and we want to help you by connecting you with a circle of people that can come alongside you and support you and so that you can invest in them as well. And so you, you need an inner circle. So let me just ask you, the second person, who, who is in your circle? Who are you developing? And here's the point if you're writing it down. What relationships am I intentionally developing? Okay, what relationships am I intentionally developing? So, so the first question was, who am I bringing along as I climb higher? This, the second one is, what relationships am I intentionally developing? The third and, and final person that we want to include in our life as we aim higher comes from Proverbs chapter 15. Take a look with me at verse 22. It says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Plans fail for lack of counsel. So as you're aiming higher, some of you this year, you have big vision. You're going to take new ground, new goals, all kinds of great things. But, but it says right here that, that plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. So in other words, some of you, the things that you're aiming higher toward, the thing that could cause you to not get to your destination and so you fail to include others in the process. It makes life so much better, but it also can ensure that you actually get where you need to go. And it doesn't just say to seek advice from someone. It says many advisors, right? Many advisors, the counsel of many advisors, counselors, mentors, coaches, instructors, parents, friends, many advisors. And not only many advisors, but there's many benefits to having these people in your life. Wisdom, a sounding board, guidance, support, encouragement, and prayer. But it takes humility to listen to others and follow direction and make correction when you've already set your mind on something, to be open to rebuke and change and correction. It takes maturity to seek feedback. In fact, one of my favorite phrases I heard from someone one time is that feedback is our friend. It's not your enemy. Feedback is your friend because it helps you get better. And that's how iron sharpens iron. I want to give you a practical example of that. When I was in my 20s, um, I was in college and in the early 20s, and I was um, working at a church. I was the student pastor there, and occasionally I'd have the opportunity to preach on Sunday morning. It was a big opportunity, and we had a couple services, and, and I always looked forward to that. And because I was a college student during the week, and I was busy and running the student ministry, I didn't get to prepare my message until late Saturday night. And I stayed up really late preparing my notes, and I was excited and ready to go. But because I'd stayed up so late and had so little sleep, I slept through my alarm. And Sunday morning came, and I woke up on my own well past my alarm, well past when I needed to get up, and so late that the first service had already started. And I was terrified. Like, you know that feeling when you feel like you've just let a bunch of people down? My stomach was all turned inside out. I felt terrible. And, but I'm like, okay, I, I still need to just show up. I don't know what's going to happen when I get there. I don't know how bad it is, but I know it's bad. So I said, I got ready. I, I wore a suit at the time, so I threw my suit on. I grabbed my Bible. I jumped in my car, and I raced to that church. I pulled in the parking lot. The service is about two-thirds of the way done. And I, I, I get to the, the back row, and I just kind of slump into the seat. 
And, and the pastor, he was up there preaching a message, and he did a great job, and he finished the service. And, and so I was like, I don't know how he pulled that off with no preparation. But I, but I, but I kind of moved up towards the front, and I sat down kind of waiting to, to talk with him. And, and I, I didn't know if he was going to ring me out and be upset at me. I didn't know if he's going to yell at me. I didn't know if he's going to fire me. I, I didn't know what to expect. But he came over at me, Pastor Robert, I'll never forget this my whole life. And he looked right in my eyes, and he said, hey, Brandon, you're up next service. Good luck. Go get them. And, and he spoke affirmation to me, encouragement. He spoke to my future and what I could be, not how I felt at the time, failure. You, you know, they say that the failure is always an event. It's never a person. It's never a person. And sometimes we can feel like a failure. Sometimes we're like, I can't figure this out. I can't get it right. But oftentimes you're, you're one person away, one advisor, one coach, one encourager away that can give you that encouragement you need or that piece of advice you need to lift you up when you're feeling low, when you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, when you don't know what to do. And there's been so many times in my life where a, a counselor, an advisor, a parent, a friend has spoken truth into my life in a low moment that's lifted me, just like that moment with Pastor Robert. I could have easily walked away from ministry and felt like, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. I'm not going to make it. But he said, I believe in you. Hey, the next service, you got this. You got this. You can do it. I believe in you. And I rose to the challenge, and I felt so good about it. But here's the thing. We need those people in our life, and, and, and the only way to get them is, is to purposefully seek them out and include them. From my experience, it's not too often that people come to you and say, let me mentor you. Let me counsel you. Usually these relationships, you have to purposely seek them out and say, can I learn with you? And you don't have to ask someone to be your mentor or your coach. You just say, hey, can I have some time with you? I, I want to bring some questions. I want to learn from you. Spend some time together. And you do that a handful of times, and before you know it, you'll have a mentor in your life. And I've done this many times. It's been such a blessing to me. And so here's, here's the final question. Who is developing me? Right? Who is developing me? Who's developed me? Who, who's that person in your life that's raising you up, that's pouring into you, that's helping you get better as you aim higher in life for the Lord? All three of these relationships are incredibly important. And if you miss out on any one of these areas, right, you're missing out on God's design for you relationally, and you're missing out on the joy that God has planned for you. And so let me just summarize for a moment, and then I want to pray for you. Who in your life are you raising up and bringing along as you move higher with Jesus? Who is it that you're reaching out to and sharing the good news with and mentoring and raising up? The second one is, who are you developing? What relationships are you investing in? Who's your inner circle? Who are the people you're experiencing life together with and spurring each other on and encouraging each other? Who are those people? And then finally, that number three, who, who's developing you? Who's, who's pouring into you? Who could speak into your life? Who can confront you when you've got it wrong? Who can encourage you? when you feel low. You need these three people in your life. I'm just telling you, your life will be richer, it'll be better, it'll be sweeter. And I, I hope you will sign up for a life group this week. I hope you'll mark out that time. I know you're busy. I know you got a lot of other competing priorities. But there's nothing that's gonna bless you more than getting in relationship. The kingdom of God is all about relationships. Relationship with God and relationships with others. You got projects, but people are always more important than projects. So, so get connected, develop these relationships, and see what God will do in your life as you aim higher and move forward. Right on, right on. Come on, let's pray. Father, I, I pray for our church fam. I, I pray, God, that you would enrich our relationships this year. As we aim higher and we seek to take new ground for your kingdom, as we have new goals and new vision in this year ahead, God, I pray that you would enrich our lives and our families with great relationships. Bring along friendships with like-minded people so that we can say, you know what? I'm not alone. I'm, I'm not the only one that's been through that journey. God, bring along mentors and coaches and counselors. May we seek them out and initiate these relationships that will be a blessing to us. God, I pray that we purposefully scan the horizon of our life to look for people who we can raise up, who we can invest into, who we can bring along as, as we aim higher, specifically people who don't yet know you, Jesus, to where their life and eternity could be forever changed because we made the intentional step of walking across the room, investing in them, and helping them find and follow Jesus. God, it gives such purpose when we have these relationships. And I, I just pray that for our church family. God, I, I know how rich it is. And, and I, I just pray that for every person, that, God, you'd fill our lives. And, God, finally today, I, I'm thinking of this, this man that we just read about in Mark chapter 2. Jesus, he, he came to you. His friends brought him to you because he had a need. He had a, he had a physical need, but, Jesus, you gave him spiritual healing, forgiveness of his sins. 
And today while we're praying, maybe there's some that are hearing this message and, and maybe your application today is you need to go find some new friends in your life. But for some of you, you don't have the greatest friendship of all time. You have believed in God generically, but you don't have a friendship with Jesus. And let me just speak to you clearly for a moment. If you don't have a close, intimate friendship with Jesus, you're missing out on the most important relationship in life. And Jesus wants to be your friend. He's a friend of sinners. Some of you are saying, well, I'm not worthy of a friendship with God. I, I've messed so many things up. I've failed so much. And you know what? Jesus will look at you in the same way that, that my pastor looked at me when I was a young man. He said, I believe in you. It's not all about your failures. It's about your future. And I believe in you. And if you'll reach out your hand, I'm already reaching mine towards you. And Jesus wants to take hold of your hand. Hand. He wants to pull you up out of that pit. Wherever you're stuck, wherever you're jammed up, Jesus wants to set you free and forgive you and restore you, just like he did that man on that mat. He forgave him and he healed him, and God can fix all the brokenness in your life. He can heal and restore like nobody else. He can do miraculous things, but you first have to place your faith in him. And so I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Jesus, I pray for, for those who are feeling that conviction from your Holy Spirit. God is from you. May they not delay this moment. This could be a life-changing, direction-changing moment. And so in this moment right now, if that's you, you want to become a friend of Jesus, just say, Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I have failed. Please forgive me, Jesus. And just trust that he's, he's faithful to forgive you. He says he will. When you confess your sins, John chapter 1, verse 9, he says that, he, that he's faithful to forgive us of all of our sins when we ask. And so just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And say, Jesus, I receive you into my life. I believe in you. And what you did on that cross 2,000 years ago, you did for me. You took my place. You, you paid the payment for my sin. Please forgive me, and I receive you into my life. And I repent for my sins. I, I want to live a new life in you, Jesus. I, I'm changing my mind. I want to live for you. You're the Lord. It's not about me anymore. It's about you. I want to live for you. Show me what that looks like. Show me in your word. Help me follow you and truly live for you, Jesus. Not a religion, but a relationship. A relationship that's for one. And God, in the end of the day, it is about relationship. It's about our relationship with you and others. And so help us to get these great relationships around us as we move forward and take new ground in this new year. Jesus, we love you so much, and we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. It's in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you made a commitment today, I hope you go to our website, and you'll fill out that contact information. And if, if you do that, if you, if you let us know that you made a commitment, our commitment to you is we're going to follow up with you and see how we can help you grow in your relationship with God. Right on. Before our usher team comes forward to receive our tithes and offerings and response cards, here's a few important things happening with our CE family. Life groups are fun, supportive groups of people where you can find healthy relationships, deepen your connection with God, and serve with others. This is a great place to meet others who want to experience a life together in Christ. Check out the updated list of available life groups on the Church Experience website. Click on your campus from the main page and then go to life groups. This is where you get connected. Life is so much better together. As our ushers come forward to collect our response cards and to receive our tithes and offerings, the generosity of God's people fuels the expansion of God's church in the world. There's no better investment to make beyond raising up more followers of Jesus. Would you please consider joining the faithful givers that are a part of CE who are sacrificing so others can follow Jesus through CE? You can give on our website, on our CE app, and in the service, or by mailing in a check. Every gift matters at CE. Thank you so much. Thank you for being on mission with us to help more people experience a full life in Jesus Christ. Sometimes you gotta stare down the giants, worship from the lion's den. Sometimes you gotta shout it from the mountain, louder in the valley, trusting that he's gonna get you there. Sometimes you gotta welcome the wonder, wait for the answer, worship with your hands in the air. I praise you anywhere, praise, give him praise. Give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy. Yes, he is worthy of all the praise. Sometimes. 
you gotta praise in the prison cry out to heaven shout it till the door swing wide sometimes you gotta stand on your shackles brave in the battle worship with your hands held high i'll praise you anywhere praise give him praise give him praise in the highest praise give him praise give him praise in the highest he I had the best time today, worshiping and learning with you. You may have made a commitment during the service. If you did, we'd love to reach out to you. If you have any questions, comments, prayer requests, again, please go to churchexperience.tv connect or scan the QR code on the screen. Want to get even more connected? Check out our CE social media, Instagram, Facebook, or the website, even the app. Go ahead and also hit that subscribe button right here. What a great day it has been. Can't wait to see you guys next week.